This is March 23rd, 2006. Uh, we're having a oral history interview this morning with Brooks Moore. I'm Charles Lundquist. Uh, thank you for coming, you, Brooks. Nice we're here. happy to have you. To get things started, could you give us a little history of where you spent your youth, where you went to school, and how you got into the space program here in Huntsville? Well, I'm a, I'm a country boy from uh, central Alabama. In fact, the little country community, uh, which you've probably never heard of, is uh, by the name of Highburger. And uh, when people look blank when I say uh, I'm from Highburger, I tell them, I'm, well, that's, half, that's halfway between Sprott and Jericho, which doesn't really clarify things very much. But it's actually down in Perry County. Uh, Marion is the county seat of Perry County, and it's... It's on the map, but anyhow, it's country, rural community. I was uh, bused to school before that became a fad, uh, bused five, six miles into uh, a Highburger Junior High School, and then uh, after I finished the ninth grade, we were bused into, into Marion, into town, as we called it. And uh, I finished uh, high school and uh, went immediately into the Navy. This was right at the tail end of... Uh, World War II, and I got into naval officer training uh, school as a part of my naval service, and uh, actually spent spent a couple of years in the Navy, and then uh, another ten years or so in reserve. Uh, but uh, after I got out of the Navy, I attended school at uh, Auburn University. Back then, it was Alabama Polytechnic Institute. I uh, received a BS degree in electrical engineering, and. Then I went over to Georgia Tech uh, for my master's degree and received a master's in electrical engineering. Uh, my first job out of school was uh, in Panama City, Florida, a uh, naval research station there. And uh, that fits your naval background. That's right. Then. That was a, sort of a carryover from my experience in the, on active duty and also my involvement in the reserves. and. So I did uh, work though as a civilian in Panama City uh, for three years, and uh, then I heard some rumblings about things that were going on up in Huntsville. Uh, one of my projects I was working on in Panama City for the Navy involved torpedoes, and I reasoned that uh, you know torpedoes and missiles are not that much different. There's ones underwater and ones in there. So uh, I heard there's a missile program going on up in Huntsville. So in I guess I came up in uh, December of uh, 51 for interview, and then we consummated the deal, and I came to work here in uh, March of 52. And I've never regretted that decision. That was uh, uh, the best uh, possible decision I could have made as far as uh, getting here and getting on the ground floor, you might say. What organization did you go into at that time? I, I was temporarily assigned to development inspection that it was called, which was the precursor of uh, the quality laboratory. Uh, my really interest was in guidance and control, and I managed to get myself loaned out to the guidance and control uh, uh, division, I guess it was at that time, uh, Dr. Hauserman. And so even though I was officially assigned to uh, the uh, development inspection group, my actual work was over in the guidance control area and, and uh, later Dr. Hausman made arrangements to get me transferred permanently to that group. So I actually started out in the in the control section working on the on the Red Star. And that led to to uh, involvement in the other system. Who were your other co workers at that time? Well, Hans Hosentine was, uh, was actually, the, I guess, called the, the team leader at that time. Uh, I worked very closely with uh, Gerhard Dravi. Uh, uh, Hubert Crow was, uh, was Dr. Hausman's deputy at that time. At that time, we had, uh, you know, the, there were 120 or so German, uh, Germans, and there wasn't many more of us native-born Americans, so we were, about half of the team was... Uh, uh, native born to America, Fred J. the J. Sue and Jack Lucas are two of the oh. individuals that, and Charlie Easley, as I recall, that uh, that I worked with uh, very early on in the in the uh, 
what was the old hospital here on Squirrel Hill, yes. where our laboratory was, simulation lab. So I was involved in uh, the, the simulations of the Redstone uh, missile from the very, very early days. When they started to launch Redstones, what was your role then? Uh, it was actually to, uh, we, we did the simulation uh, leading up to the launch, and, uh, and our responsibility, of course, was the, uh, was the control system out of that, that small group. We didn't really have the, the there was no guidance sanction on the very first Redstone, so our responsibility was uh, preparing to be sure that everything was, uh, was in order for a successful flight, and then uh, as I recall, I was not actually at the Cape, but we were monitoring the activities from here in Huntsville, and then we uh, we were involved in taking the <clears throat> the flight instrumentation records and uh, and comparing them and uh, analyzing the results of that very first launch. That was in I guess August of 1953. After the Redstone got going, of course, the Jupiter program began with. ABMA and General Madeira's. I'm sure you have fond memories of that time. Very much so. Uh, we we phased over from the from the Redstone into the into the Jupiter program, uh, and the Jupiter, of course, being an incontinental ballistic missile, uh, 1,500 mile range, and that was uh, instigated by the space race with the with the Russians. But uh, what we took was essentially the same. Principles that we've used in the in the Redstone and uh, carried those forward into the the Jupiter system. There were certainly some uh, some differences, key differences from the standpoint of our uh, control system. We would used uh, electrical motors uh, on the Redstone. We used uh, hydraulic actuators on the Jupiter, uh, and there were a lot of similarities as far as the actual. Uh, internal uh, aspects of the control systems and as we got into the Jupiter I also became involved in the guidance system in that uh, the guidance and control functions were actually combined and I worked with Jim Farrier I was his deputy uh, during the uh, during the Jupiter development days and what was the name of that organization or that? Well, it was called the uh, it was called the Navigation uh, Branch at the time that we uh, uh, that we were working on the Jupiter. That was why we were still with the Army. Uh, it was later renamed uh, and expanded to become the Guidance and Control Division, uh, in as we became part of uh, of NASA. Of course, one of the big events uh, before we get into the NASA aspect, you know, was the uh, Explorer 1 launch towards the end of the decade of the 1950s, and that was using the old reliable Redstone. At that time, uh, status of uh, missile development, uh, there was a lot of, a lot of failures uh, in the various different sy systems that were being evolved at that time, and the Redstone, the Army's Redstone, it proved to be the most reliable. So when the time came, it, we we realized that the Russians were ahead of us in the space uh, business, and it, it launched their Sputnik. Uh, we got the assignment to uh, to put up uh, our first satellite, Explorer One, and of course we had the old reliable Redstone as the uh, as the launch vehicle for that. So I was. He was involved in that, uh, getting the the uh, Redstone ready for that Explorer One launch. Now, your laboratory director at that time, uh, uh, Hauserman, Walter Hauserman, and Ernst Strudinger were the two people who actually pushed redundantly <laughs> pushed the button to fire the second stage of the rocket that launched Explorer One. That's correct. That was, they both were. Uh, we intimately involved in key people, and I've worked uh, worked very closely with with both of them, particularly Dr. Hauserman. And that uh, from my er very early days when I came in, uh, Dr. Hauserman uh, apparently took a liking to me. I consider him my mentor. He uh, he was uh, uh, always uh, seemed to to look to me and uh, allow me to get involved in uh, in a lot of things, and actually to pro promote me into. Uh, Supervisor position, so I, I sort of give him credit for my my career with uh, in the missile business, and then later with NASA. 
1960, of course, you were part of the team that was transferred by presidential order from the Army to, to NASA on July 1st, 1960. That's correct. I was a, a charter member of the of Marshall Space Flight Center in that respect, and uh, due to circumstances, uh, uh, as we entered the, uh, the organization with NASA, uh, Jim Farrier had left in the meantime, and uh, this organization that previously called the Navigation Division uh, became the guidance and control division, and I became director of that. Uh, so I reported to Dr. Hausman as director of the guidance and control division in the uh, early years of the uh, of our involvement with Saturn and with the uh, uh, Saturn development. What was your role in the Saturn program? <clears throat> well, it was essentially uh, the guidance and control system in the early days, uh, and that was uh, involved. Uh, we, we actually evolved from our experience on Redstone and Jupiter, and we've already, as you know, before we uh, actually became official part of NASA, we already had funding to do some development of a precursor that of the Saturn. Ar 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 that was ARPA funded, and what we did was uh, take in the concepts that we developed for the military systems and uh, and use those to to do some preliminary design and we already you know had had some plans on the on the board uh, before uh, NASA was created and before we came a part of NASA but my role was uh, I guess uh, historically my main focus personally from my own in the lab type of work was the control area, but as uh, as it progressed into other uh, or, uh, supervisory jobs, of course the guidance system. So the uh, the stabilized platform and the guidance and control computers and the actuators; uh, those were the areas that I was involved in in the early days of the Saturn. Uh, and then later, uh, I became laboratory director. With, uh, do you remember any of the problems you had to overcome in getting the Saturn ready to go? Well, I guess there were were a lot of problems uh, that we had to overcome. Uh, we had uh, as the computer comes to mind as one of those uh, areas that we were actually uh, uh, plowing new ground technologically in a sense for the uh, the computer system uh, that we uh, we was being developed uh, by IBM and we did have a number of uh, problems that uh, required uh, some some changes along the way component uh, problems and changes and uh, of course we we had a redundant system it was built with the intent of, uh, of being of being able to stand a number of failures and uh, even though we had uh, some failures in testing, uh, we actually never had a flight failure of, uh, in, in the computer system nor in the stabilized platform system, which are the key elements of the Saturn program. So we had, uh, had a number of uh, problems that you'd have in, uh, in, in development of uh, particularly advancing the state of the art in that regard. When did you become laboratory director? I became laboratory director in 1968. Uh, there was a reorganization internal within uh, uh, the science and engineering directorate, it was called at that time. And there was a desire to set up a system uh, laboratory. And uh, Dr. Hauserman uh, was des selected. Uh, we, we hear the story, it was almost like the, the popes are selected. The laboratory directors got together and uh, none of them necessarily wanted that system job, but uh, they, uh, Von Brown told them they had to get together and come out with a decision that one of them was going to take the systems lab, and so they could just send up a smoke signal like the pope they do with the select pope when they had uh, made a decision. Uh, and Dr. Hausman ended up being that selectee for that job and uh, he called me at home uh, that evening after that and uh, broke the news to me that he had accepted the job only with the understanding that I'd be made laboratory director of the astronaut. By then that was called the astronautics lab which uh, 
had not only the guidance and control, but all the electrical systems, the power systems, the instrumentation systems, and uh, everything. That, well, it was the avionics version of, of space, which we call astrionics. Well, you also had lots of involvement in the experiments. Uh, Joseph Berm, for instance, was very deeply involved in we certainly did designing experiments and right. equipment to go and on the science side. Right, and that was uh, was another area that we we supported very heavily the space science uh, space sciences area and uh, and did a lot of the design of, uh, of the mechanical packaging related to uh, uh, to flight experiments and the electronics uh, supporting the flight experiments. So we we did. Uh, have a very good cooperative effort uh, from the science, from supporting the science experiments as well. And of course, there was the lunar lunar landing in '69. Where were you in that all? Uh, actually, I was at the Cape for the launch, uh, and uh, with my family. You know, we we went to the Cape so many times and so for for so many launches. I honestly did not remember whether I was there for the lunar launch. You would think that I, that would be something to stick in my memory, but uh, I wasn't absolutely sure because it didn't go to every launch. But uh, here recently I ran across a postcard that I sent to an uncle and aunt of mine. Really? <laughs> Postmarked at the Cape, you know, uh, on the day of the launch. So you have evidence. Telling them I was there and that my family was out in the stands. I had two two sons that were... Oh, uh, about eight and ten years old at that time, and I uh, made it a point. So I've got uh, written verification, although not official, <laughs> official that I was there. But uh, I was there and in the in the launch control room, according to my card, uh, at the time of the launch. And uh, then I returned to Huntsville. So I was in Huntsville at the time they actually landed. And there were plans to get together, uh, you know, to, to wait and, and see and hope, because uh, uh, it was, as you know, televised, there was a lot going on, but, uh, and I had several opportunities and invitations to participate with groups, uh, but I honestly wanted to be alone. I was, it was, even though our portion of the job was done, of course, as we successfully launched, uh, on the route to the moon, uh, I remained so uh, uptight, let's say, about the whole thing that I didn't feel like I wanted to be anywhere but just at home with my family. That's where I was. Well, of course, after after that, Skylab came along, and your laboratory had a lot to do with Skylab, I know. We certainly did. That was our nation's uh, first space Base station, and uh, we were heavily involved in the design of it. Of course, that was taking uh, Saturn Apollo hardware and uh, putting it together uh, in a very low cost, relatively low cost uh, program. Uh, there was a lot of new challenges with uh, with Skylab, uh, particularly in the control area, because there was no. There was no guidance per se, that you might say, uh, as far as the, of course there was guidance of the launch vehicle, but we used an existing launch vehicle, the Saturn 1B and, and, and the Saturn 5, I guess, for the actual launch. But uh, actually, the uh, in the control system, this was quite a challenge because the intent was to stay on orbit for many months, and we needed to have a control system that would not run out of uh, <coughs> Fuel. The, the conventional way to control uh, spacecraft, of course, was with the uh, reaction control system, which is expendable, which means you have a limited amount of propellant, and therefore a limited amount of control time and control force. So we had to look around for new uh, techniques of control back then as far as actually applying the torques to the spacecraft, and that's where we came up with the concept is called control moment gyros, which was a huge uh, gyroscope that we use the reaction force uh, by talking the gyroscope, uh, use the reaction force of that to, uh, to apply forces to the, to the vehicle. Uh, this was a, 
uh, joint effort. We didn't start that from scratch here at Marshall at the time that uh, that we had the need. There was already some research work going on, technological development up at Langley, and we uh, cooperated with them and took their the work they had done with control mounted gyros and and evolved it into a flyable system. Of course, that was strictly laboratory experimental, but. That was one of the very unique things about the uh, the Skylab was the manner in which we co controlled it. And uh, of course, we did use uh, we had to have sun sensors and uh, and other uh, star trackers for for sensing for position and attitude control. Uh, of course, there was also precision pointing system, the Apollo telescope mount uh, with the control moment gyros. We couldn't control spacecraft sufficiently accurately for some of the experiments like the solar experiment, the Apollo telescope mount, which was to focus on uh, high resolution uh, pictures of the sun. So we did have to have a separate Apollo telescope mount, we called it, which was really an optical bench that was precision controlled with uh, electromechanical torques, and we could get down to a few arc seconds of uh, resolution with that and uh, so for for the experiments like the earth pointing experiments that we had uh, on Skylab we uh, could use just the uh, six plus minus six minute resolution we control we had with the control mount gyros but for the some of the precision experiments we had to have this additional control system. What was your role during the first few days after the the mishap on, on the launch, and well, it surely was, the electrical problems uh, were sig significant. The electrical problems were very significant, and of course, we, because we had lost one of the solar rays and uh, the other didn't deploy properly, so we had uh, initially the main problem was keeping the Skylab alive. That was keeping uh, keeping it under some sort of control with a limited amount of power. Uh, and we had to worry about the, uh, the particular the thermal aspects of the factors pointing towards the sun. We had the solar uh, heat to worry about and the dissipation. So part of it was to try to keep <coughs> sort of rotisserie effect uh, going and keep the attitude control of the uh, spacecraft so we could uh, keep it uh, keep it functional until we could get a crew up there to do something about uh, about the anomaly of the of the uh, solar rays. So there were there were two aspects, I guess, the the solar power, how we balanced the solar power, how we tried to use the uh, Apollo telescope mount solar rays, which had deployed properly uh, <clears throat> for the full spacecraft. And then the, the other was keeping that uh, attitude controlled, and that was something, uh, you know, we were, we were actually doing this from uh, the, what's now called the HOSC, the uh, Huntsville Operations Support Center. I don't know what the name of it was back then, but I remember being over there in 4663 uh, during those critical times when we uh, were trying to keep, keep Skylab under control until we could get a crew up there. And, uh, of course, the... We, we were successful in getting a crew up and getting uh, getting the system back online, and it actually worked for, I guess we had nine nine months of, of successful uh, mission with with, a, with our Skylab. Well, actually, the control moment gyros continued to do a yeoman's job through the reentry of Skylab. Were you actually, involved in that? Well, yes, uh, we actually uh, unfortunately lost, we have three, had con three control moment gyros. Uh, we lost one in the early days of the third mission, the third manned mission. And uh, fortunately, the system had been designed so we could control with two control moment gyros. So we were, we were able to, uh, to maintain uh, control and uh, through the rest of the mission for that third man mission and then to maintain control up until, as you point out, the Skylab uh, re-entered. Now, I was actually not actively involved uh, in that that operational aspect. At I think that, that was Herman uh, Thomason. Herman Thomason. Dick Smith was, I yeah. think, uh, involved. And, uh, but uh, we were involved from the standpoint of 
still monitoring, and my laboratory was involved. I had Lewis, Lewis Cook and, uh, and other key, uh, key technical people that were involved in monitoring the systems up until the reentry. By the way, uh, I uh, think that's one of the most unfortunate decisions that were made at NASA while I've been there during my 50 years of involvement in the space program. Uh, we had a teleoperator retrieval system that we had designed with intent of going up to reboost Skylab, and due to budgetary constraints uh, in the time frame, the early uh, 80s, when the focus was, well, really, actually, late 70s, the focus is on the, on the shuttle, putting all money in the shuttle, and... Uh, you know, the theory was, well, we'll have the shuttle ready. It can go up and reboot Skylab. Uh, there were a lot of us that were very skeptical of whether the shuttle could be developed that rapidly, and sure enough, uh, it was not. The uh, decision was made not to continue with the teleoperator retrieval system, which was already well designed in, uh, in beginning fabrication. So uh, I, uh, you know, I've always regretted and felt like that that was a major setback when the decision was made that uh, we had to, we could not reboot Skylab so it could uh, remain in orbit until we could go up and refurbish and do things like that. Uh, I feel like we would have been 15, 20 years ahead in our development of space station if we had kept Skylab because we you know, essentially started started over from scratch years later. But that's just one of those regrets I have. <laughs> well, you mentioned the shuttle. Uh, surely your lab had deep roles in the development of the Marshall part of the shuttle. Yes, we were we were heavily involved <clears throat> in in all of the uh, the electronics and the computer systems of the propulsion, the related to the propulsion elements. Of course, in the in the shuttle program. Uh, the actual guidance function is performed from the orbiter, which was not our primary responsibility, but uh, we had uh, a heavy involvement in, uh, in all, spec all aspects of the electronics and instrumentation and control of the solid rocket boosters and the, in the uh, space shuttle main engine, uh, which was uh, by far a more complex engine than we had ever flown before. And it was the first uh, engine to have its own uh, digital computer. So we had, uh, uh, that, we had that responsibility of, of developing and, uh, and environmentally hardening uh, digital computer to hang right on the, on the side of, uh, of the space shuttle main engine. And of course, in the development of the software, associated with that because it, that, that engine is, is extremely complex and did require uh, the sophistication of a computer. So we were involved in uh, very heavily my laboratory in getting, the, getting those uh, systems ready and uh, the elect all the electronics uh, and the, uh, the thrust vector control system of the solid rocket booster. We have a hydraulic uh, thrust vector control system. That was a responsibility of my laboratory at okay. that time frame. I think your laboratory had at least some involvement in some of the experiments that Marshall was responsible for putting on the shuttle. Well, certainly, uh, you know, we were involved in the solar experiments back in the Skylab. Uh, uh, we were involved in uh, in the early days of uh, of the famous uh, GPB, that uh, I guess was the longest uh, lived uh, ex development that that uh, in existence, and that uh, and I well remember going to the West Coast back when I was uh, lab director and uh, hearing a, a pitch from Dan DeBray yep. about the system that he wanted to to fly, and that was the beginning of GPB, and I guess that program. Uh, lasted for, what, 30 years or 35 years before it was finally successfully launched uh, about two years ago. And the analysis is still the going on. Analysis is still going on. But we had uh, had involvement here again in, uh, 
ours was a support role always to the scientists uh, of uh, supporting in whatever way we could uh, the electronic aspects and control anything that re required control. Uh, well, even before GPB, there was gravity probe A, and right. some of your laboratory people I know were deeply involved right. in it. We were, we certainly were. That was. Uh, we, in fact, anything, I guess, the, of our experiment nature that was uh, uh, worked on in that time frame, we had a pretty heavy involvement. If it involved electronics, which is almost uh, given, uh, we had the design of the electronics and, uh, uh, and the, in, in many cases, elect the packaging aspects of the system. Yeah. Well, as the shuttle matured, uh, I guess you eventually uh, decided to re retire. Uh, I did. When did that and how did that happen? Well, I, I retired uh, in, uh, in November of 81. Uh, uh, it was, in fact, right after the uh, second shuttle launch. I was uh, on board for the first shuttle launch and uh, uh, in the uh, Huntsville Operations Support Center for, for both both of those first two launches of the shuttle and uh, but I uh, did retire in uh, in March of, I mean in, uh, in November of 81 and uh, have continued my involvement though in, in the space program I, I did spend a couple of years uh, over Teldyne Brown uh, working on a military program I did have a Understanding with Dr. Lucas, who was center director at that time, that I wouldn't show back up on the doorstep after leaving. Uh, had, he had a little bit of sensitivity about that, even though I had no legal constraints, uh, I think, of working back with Marshall. I spent a couple of years uh, uh, working on a military program that tell I'm Brown, and then I uh, became involved with a small company here, Control Dynamics, a couple of... Uh, Gentleman from uh, NASA, from Marshall, had started uh, a few years before I retired. Dr. Sherman Selton and uh, Dr. Gene Worley, and I joined them in '84. Uh, and I'm still involved with uh, with that company. Oh, you it's, are. Uh, it's just uh, it's been bought and sold a couple of times, uh, and we are now operating as a part about uh, as a part of the BD Systems Corporation. We have advanced technology division here locally. I've, I'm no longer in the management. I was uh, with the director of this local operation for several years, but uh, five, six years ago I decided I wanted to go on a part-time basis and uh, not, not work those 40, 50, 60 hour weeks. And uh, so I went to part-time basis and they still provide me an office and I uh, come and go work 15 hours a week, 20 hours a week sometimes. We still, and our primary customer is Marshall Space Flight Center and their, uh, their primes. Uh, we work, we have contracts with, of course, with Teldyne Brown and with uh, Lockheed and with Boeing and uh, uh, United Space Alliance. And uh, so we're, I'm still involved uh, to some extent in what's going on. We're looking forward to the, the new uh, launch vehicle, the uh, crew launch vehicle that's uh, presently uh, under design, uh, beginning uh, in the conceptual phases. So it's been a, been a good, uh, good career, involved in a lot of, a lot of firsts that I uh, never had any regret of making that decision to, to come to Huntsville. I, I was really on the ground floor it, and I was at the right place at the right time, and uh, you know I consider myself uh, most fortunate to have been associated with the with that original German team, the von Braun team, and uh, I still uh, have a close relationship with those that are still still here. As you know, there's only about a dozen anymore. But uh, and I've uh, you know I had a lot of. Uh, very close associations, uh, not only with the German team, but with others that have been been involved uh, from the early days on down to uh, to the more recent times. Well, so you, you've been involved in the organization of the NASA Retirees Association. Right. Uh, Can you comment a little on that? Well, uh, 
we there was a, a headquarters that started out in headquarters, a uh, NASA uh, retirement association, and uh, they had a they had a desire to have chapters formed at uh, several of the centers, but there seemed to be no one taking a very aggressive uh, lead in that, and uh, even though. There was a little bit of movement in that direction. I think uh, Jim Murphy had, had done something early on and uh, had a small group together. And somewhere along the way, I'm not sure who uh, asked me if I would uh, take over. The, the, situ the group was essentially dormant, even though in, in name only. We had, a, we, had a, we had a chapter in headquarters, but we really didn't have an active chapter here. So. Uh, I thought, well, that sounds like a, a good thing because I've always felt very close to uh, close camaraderie with uh, with my fellow workers, and uh, you know, even though some people can walk off and leave it, then some retirees have, and they don't want to look back. I I've never cut that tie in any re in that, that tie in any regard, and my desire was to stay involved, not only actively in the space program but stay in close touch with uh, with my friends and uh, I saw this uh, NASA Alumni League as a, as a way of doing that and so I uh, took the initiative and uh, recruited a few uh, folks to help me like Bob Middleton there was uh, one of those key guys in the in the early days that uh, that showed a great interest and, and helped me uh, work with others and we we have uh, it started a very, uh, very active group, and and were involved for a number of years as an element of the uh, the the NASA Retiree Association that was headquartered in Washington. Uh, and somewhere along the way, it was after uh, I, I kept the presidential role for longer than I should have. Uh, couldn't uh, couldn't get anybody else to take it on, but. Uh, uh, I finally was successful in recruiting uh, uh, someone to, to help to, to take it over, and I've continued, continued to serve on the executive committee. But uh, we've had uh, several very active folks that have uh, that have carried on in the meantime, and we are still uh, we're still active. Uh, we have uh, broken away from the NASA headquarters uh, in that we really there really wasn't a lot of synergism and. And they were not able to get much interest at some of the other centers, and so we have we actually formed our own what we call the Marshall Retiree Association, and that's we operate under that name now, and we have a very active operation. Uh, we have uh, four socials a year, and uh, we have typically a turnout of uh, 75, sometimes as many as 100. Uh, we are looking at, uh, we try to do anything we can to assist uh, Marshall Space Flight Center. We consider that as part of our role is to do anything we can to assist Marshall. And so we have offered uh, and are presently dealing with uh, Charles Chitwood, the deputy uh, center director, uh, to see if there's something we can do in a, in a more organized way to uh, maybe monitor uh, and to uh, to mentor uh, some of the younger people at, at Marshall. There is concern that we've lost a lot as uh, there's a, with the retirees that have left in the meantime, and and Marshall was in a little bit of a stagnant role in hiring, and so there's been a gap of experience developed there. But we're working directly with uh, Chitwood now. We're looking at some possibilities of how we could organize different specialty groups that would uh, act as advisors and maybe meet with uh, the counterparts at Marshall that are working current problems. And with the hopes that, particularly now with the uh, the, the new uh, direction of the crew launch vehicle it uh, has a lot of similarities back to the Saturn the Saturn launch vehicles you know possibility of using SRB for the first stage uh, which of course that was the that was a, uh, a shuttle development but the concept of the configuration would be like the Saturn in that it would be an inline instead of a side mount uh, shuttle 
And so we'd have an inline uh, two-stage vehicle, which is, has a lot of similarity to the, uh, to the Saturn. So I think the, the thinking that Marshall's management is that there are a number of people that are members in our Marshall Retiree Association that have still uh, maybe a lot to offer as far as experience. So we want to, we're, we're hoping to cooperate and to help them in that regard. Nice to look to the future, isn't it? Oh, very definitely. And it looks like we're back on track. I think NASA, with their administrator, uh, new administrator Mike Griffin, is certainly, uh, I think we're, good things are happening. They're getting more focused, and I think Marshall's assignment is becoming clearer. And uh, I just hope we can stay on track and actually make it back to the moon and, uh, and beyond. Well, before we end, is there anything else you'd like to add to the interview? Any reminiscences or overall views? Well, uh, like I say, I have mentioned earlier that I consider myself most fortunate to have been at the right place at the right time. And uh, I'd rather be lucky than smart any time. <laughs> and uh, I feel like I was very lucky to have come into a situation that I came into uh, and to have been, had the privilege to be involved in so many firsts, like the first ballistic missile launch, that was the Redstone, and I was there. I helped design it and was involved in the launch. And then the intercontinental ballistic missile, the Jupiter, that was the U.S. first. And then the first satellite, the uh, Explorer 1, and uh, the first space station, Skylab. And, and then, uh, of course, the, I guess the highlight of uh, my career and probably many others that were along my contemporaries is, has to be the Saturn, the Saturn launch vehicle and uh, being involved in that. And uh, I'm most pleased with the recognition that that program is now getting at the Space and Rocket Center with the refurbishment of the Saturn and we're going to have it uh, housed so it uh, can be better displayed. And, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I feel most fortunate to have uh, been involved in, in all, in regard to all of these. Uh, and I owe a lot to all of my uh, uh, fellow employees because, you know, even though I was involved and uh, worked myself up into, as I call it, the ranks of the non-contributors, you know, when you get to <laughs> division and lab level, uh, if you don't have good people, you're nothing. And uh, I was always fortunate to have uh, very good people that worked with me, and, uh, and not only within my organization, but to interface with people like yourself uh, when we were co-lab directors and you were science, uh, in the science area, and, and I was trying to provide whatever support I could. I mean, you did very side. well. but. Uh, I have no regrets, uh, and, and uh, I feel I'm most fortunate, and, and I'm pleased that even though the budgetary constraints are pretty severe, that at least there's a focus for, for NASA for the future, and, and I'm hopeful that, uh, that things that we're going to get the shuttle flying again, and, and I've got my fingers crossed about getting back up there and. Uh, service in that Hubble Space Telescope. We didn't talk about that, but uh, among all the missions that we have uh, talked about, Chuck, I guess the one that in my mind is just as important right up there at the very top is the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah, I'm glad you remembered to mention that. Because, and of course, I was, by the time it was finalized, I was uh, already had left NASA, but we already did a lot of the early work before I left NASA, and I was heavily involved in that and <clears throat> but the Hubble is uh, is something that I hope we can save and I know that Mike Griffin is trying to posture the shuttle program so he can save the Hubble and I hope it doesn't suffer the same fate that the Skylab did because I I will have the same feelings about that that uh, we should do everything we can to save uh, a, a vehicle that is still we're getting astounding new information right. every day from the Space Telescope, right. the first of the great observatories, and then the, the other two that we had behind that, the High Energy Astronomical Observatory and the Chandra 
and uh, of course those uh, uh, I think also still the, the, the information we're gathering. But we've learned more about the, the universe in the last 15 years with those, uh, those great observatories. And, and so I'm just hoping. That's, that's my concern about the future is that we, that the shuttle will not only get back flying for the space station, but in all honesty, uh, <laughs> I think serves in that the uh, Hubble Space Telescope is the most important thing we could do if we get the shuttle flying again. Well, thank you very much for well, coming for the interview, and well, we wish you well, and are very pleased you, you helped us out with the interview. Well, I thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and to reminisce with you. <laughs> thank you.